The devices are implanted pretty much across the country. Uh, in this country, uh, and we track this information through the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, we implant roughly about 10,000 defibrillators a month. So do the math, it's about 100, 120,000 uh, a, a year. And obviously the, the, the most, uh, the most uh, common places of getting it are on the East Coast, um, but there's certainly a, a good smattering of, of implanters throughout the rest of the country. So the defibrillators are very different from, from pacemakers. Um, this is a picture of a pacemaker uh, where the device is really designed to just prevent your heart from going too slow. And defibrillators uh, have not only pacemaker features in it, but they also have the ability to shock your heart out of any potential lethal arrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. And the size differences you can, you can pretty much see here um, are, are quite considerable, but they're relatively still small enough for us to implant uh, above the diaphragm uh, and sort of just uh, right below the clavicle. There's a lot of studies that have shown that, um, that experience matters. Um, people who do uh, a few of them every month or just a handful of them a month have a higher risk of infection complications and, and other sort of, uh, um, sort of uh, bad outcomes in that regard. Um, and so the, the most common uh, sort of complications associated with the device implant uh, really include infection, bleeding, um, perforation of the heart, um, perforation uh, to pneumothoraces in terms of getting access uh, to the, to, to the, to the uh, subclavian vein, which is the main conduit that we use to get the leads uh, into the heart. Uh, but over, over time, the most common sort of complications that patient may experience is, is, is the risk of infection. Um, you know, you've got something indwelling in your body, you've got something indwelling in the vessels, uh, and so that may be a problem in, in, in the future. You try to pick the right people uh, for the right procedure for one. Um, and, and there's a newer device uh, that just came out called the subcutaneous defibrillator that obviates the need for us to actually put this into the blood vessels, put this into the heart. Uh, and, and this is a picture of this. Um, you can see it's, it's quite considerably larger uh, than the standard traditional defibrillator, but nevertheless, it allows us to implant these things right underneath the skin so we don't have to put in anything into the vein or into the heart or anything like that. I think everybody, um, because we're, we're often dealing with patients who have a cardiomyopathy, which the primary care physician's involved with, the cardiologist is involved with, and, and in some instances, the surgeons are involved with. I think the general cardiologist, the cardiac electrophysiologist, like myself, and, and the cardiac surgeons are, are pretty well aware of this technology uh, and the ability to save lives through this type of intervention. Um, the people that uh, tend often to sort of ask more questions about this, appropriately so, are the internists. Uh, those who, who see patients on a regular day-to-day -day basis and, and wonder if this is something that, that, that should be appropriate for their patients. How it works. Um, is my patient the right person for this? Uh, what are the downsides uh, associated with this type of device? And, and, and as importantly, what are the upsides as well? As we're getting uh, further and further along uh, in, in the way we, we, we care for patients in a different way, and what I mean by that is, is that there's been a greater emphasis over the last several years about shared decision making. Um, not having the physician uh, make the decision for the patient, but actually laying the, the options for the patient to decide what they want to do. Um, these are options that physicians should talk to their patients about. Um, and if it piques patients' interests, uh, then uh, by all means, um, a referral to an electrophysiologist would be, would be appropriate to discuss whether or not it's appropriate or not. Yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing that's 100%. Um, you know, from a relative risk reduction standpoint, defibrillators have about a hazard of 0 0.6 in terms of reducing sudden death. So there is still that possibility, um, but it's significantly lower than if you didn't have the defibrillator in place. It, it absolutely does work. Um, we're hoping that the defibrillator that's implanted will take care of the problem. Um, but if it doesn't, then, then by all means, uh, there's, there's no reason why someone can't get externally defibrillated. I think the latter. Um, I think uh, these devices are large. And uh, while these defibrillators last for about seven to nine years in terms of battery life, these things are roughly about five to seven years uh, in terms of battery life. And you can see how considerably larger it is uh, relative to the traditional defibrillator. Uh, and so I think a, a lot of research uh, will need to be focused on trying to miniaturize this to some degree, uh, if you will, making the battery last longer, uh, 
providing more value um, to, to these implants. Because every time you cut the skin open to get into this, there's always that risk of infection. And if this thing gets infected, then unfortunately the whole thing has to be extracted to, to rid that infection. These devices uh, are hooked up to a lead that goes into the heart, these traditional ones. And uh, when the battery comes due uh, for, for change out, we, we simply disconnect this thing off the, off the lead, check the, light, the lead to make sure that they're, they're, they're functioning fine, uh, and then just basically in, and put in a new one and, and sew it up. So far, so yes, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and I think um, there, there's been no question um, in everyone's mind that these things save lives. Um, the difficulty has been that there's been a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the benefit, meaning that even though your objection fraction may be low um, and you, at least by guidelines, would be eligible for this device, not everybody benefits to the same degree. And that's where a lot of our research has been focused on, a lot of research from other groups as well, to figure out among the people with low ejection fractions, who would benefit the most. Uh, a lot of more questions than answers, unfortunately, uh, as is with uh, mo most things. Um, and I think um, where, 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 what we are learning um, is, is that um, this is certainly uh, beneficial to the 60 to 75 to even possibly the 80-year-old individual. But as you get older and older and older, uh, there, there is a tendency of uh, accruing other sort of modes of death, if you will. You know, somebody in their 90s can die of COPD or, or malignancy. And, and when you start accruing different modes of death, as we call it, competing modes of death, then the absolute amount of benefit that the defibrillator provides is limited uh, because the proportion of your total death attributed to sudden death gets lower because you've just got more different possibilities, more different ways to die. One step at a time. And I think uh, this is, uh, you know, it's going to be a case-by-case -case decision uh, that involves the patient as, as importantly as it does the, the primary physician as well as the electrophysiologist. And, uh, and, and what I would uh, caution people to, to keep in mind is that uh, involve the patient uh, in these decisions. This is a shared decision process in this day and age. Uh, they need to be involved in this, pr in, in this process. You can give them their recommendations, but they're ultimately uh, responsible for their own decisions. We're continuing this, uh, this effort to better understand the biology of sudden death. Um, the hope is that we can identify triggers. If we can identify very robust triggers of these events, then maybe we can try to address those issues as opposed to just putting a defibrillator in everybody and uh, hoping for the best.